Hello, this is Dean Kernut, and welcome to the Alpha Exchange, where we explore topics in financial markets associated with managing risk, generating return, and the deployment of capital in the alternative investment industry. With more than two decades of experience trading and managing risk in sell-side and buy-side roles, Mimi Duff has learned a thing or two about high finance. In the early 90s, she cut her teeth writing research for agency and treasury securities at Goldman Sachs. She'd later move to trading, focused on making markets in the long end, utilizing a framework for the relative value of securities across the curve. We review some of the prominent risk events she's traded through, including September 11th and the reverberations of volatility in market prices that resulted. Mimi makes the point that the emotional response to an event so tragic tests a trader's capacity to manage risk. We also explore the GFC and the front row seat that Mimi had to this transaction. Running the swaps trading desk at Barclays, she was responsible for the interest rate exposure that came about through the Lehman acquisition, calculating first and second order risks and then implementing a hedging program in the market. Our conversation moves to her current role at Gen Trust, a sophisticated wealth advisor catering to high net worth individuals where she runs the New York office. For Mimi, wealth management all starts with having a plan and a suitable client benchmark. In this context, we discuss the work that Gen Trust does in delivering portfolio construction, diversification, and tax planning services to ultra high net worth individuals and investment entities. In evaluating opportunities for clients, the team is willing to consider alternative, sometimes off the run risk exposures. But illiquidity risk is taken on only in instances where the expected return profile and diversification outcome is especially favorable. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Alpha Exchange, my conversation with Mimi Duff. My guest today on the Alpha Exchange is Mimi Duff. She is a managing director and head of the New York office at Gen Trust, a sophisticated RIA helping clients manage assets. Mimi, thanks for joining me on the Alpha Exchange. Thanks for having me, Dean. Looking forward to the conversation. I'm really glad we were introduced. And why don't we just get started with the early days of your career? So you came out of Cornell with a background in engineering and operations research. Tell us how you got to Wall Street. Walk through a little bit of your career path. As you mentioned, I studied engineering. I was not one of these kids that knew exactly what they wanted to do when they were 16 or 18 or even 20. My life circumstances were such that I had an ailing parent and I wanted to be in the tri-state area. And in 1993, the finance companies and advisory firms around New York City were trying to hire a lot of engineers because they need the math skills, frankly. So I sort of lucked into landing at Goldman as my friend's parents were saying, oh, yeah, you got to take that offer. So that's kind of how I ended up at Goldman. And I spent my first years in the fixed income research department. I would say one of the things that kept me in finance is that the world of finance is continually evolving. And my roles at Goldman also evolved as I spent some time in research and then moved to trading. And I was living in London for four years when I was working in trading as well. So there was a real evolution there. And with the changing financial picture, it just always kept things interesting. Well, back in 1993, so it goes back a ways, but there were kind of a series of advancements in terms of modeling of yield curves and options and so forth. And as you suggested, it seemed like at that point on the street, there was a lot of interest in not necessarily hiring folks that had a lot of experience, but just that that had this core expertise just on maybe the academic side. Certainly some of what you learn in engineering can translate into some of the fancy stuff and option modeling and instrument modeling. Tell us just about that process of you winding up at Goldman Sachs and the interest then in hiring folks like yourself who had this background. I think you put it well, when it comes down to it for me, it's all about the skill of problem solving, which I've been able to carry out throughout my career. But let me give you an early example of that. When I was in fixed income research and I was writing research for agency and treasury markets, at that time, 
the agencies, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Home Loan Bank, were sourcing their debt through this MTN shelves. They were very frequent borrowers, and that turned out wasn't really the most advantageous source of funding for them. So I did all the research behind Fannie and Freddie's benchmark and reference note programs, which help them aggregate their financing needs and source better liquidity and better funding levels. That's not the most high-tech problem, but it was a real-life problem that we were able to solve during my time at Goldman for those large issuers. Tell us just a little bit more about getting your way onto the Goldman Sachs trading floor. So it's 1993. We're just about to have this epic Fed tightening cycle that kind of broke a lot of things. The tequila crisis in the aftermath, of course, Orange County and Procter & Gamble. What were some of the recollections you can share just around that time of tumult in fixed income markets? When I was moving into trading, it was a little further along into the late 90s, but I have to tell you, it was equally interesting with some of the emerging market debt crises and into the early 2000s. But it was a natural move for me because at that time, the desk strategists were sitting on the trading desks and I knew all the traders very well. And I was behind a lot of the research behind At that time, there was a lot of proprietary trading on the desks as well. So that was a natural shift for me. But in terms of real stormy situations, I mean, I would say the early 2000s, SEP 11, trading through that situation was really a career. I hate to call it a highlight, but really stretched anybody's ability to stay emotionless in the face of really tumultuous markets. Tell us maybe a little bit more about that period. Of course, we're really at the 25th anniversary of the unwind of LTCM. It's the August of 1998, Russia defaults, and that sets in motion a series of events of which a lot of the prop desks were caught off sides with some of the capital and the strategies that were similarly invested to long-term. You had a tech bubble, and then as you mentioned, this tragedy of 9-11 9-11 that, of course, made its way into the markets with huge reverberations. What are some of the observations or some of the lessons that come out of those periods in terms of managing risk and interest rate risk? I would say the biggest lesson is to remain emotionless in terms of being able to make the best decision-making and the best risk-taking decisions during those times. I mean, I can tell you There's people behind all these things, so it's not always easy, but to the degree, if you look at many, many of the great traders, they remain detached, and I think that's really needed in those circumstances to better evaluate various paths and where the risk-taking makes the most sense. So I can tell you during SEP 11, for instance, I was on the dollar rates desk overseas in London, and due to all the crazy turmoil in lower Manhattan, we brought the dollar rates global business to London at that time. And there were many global players that needed to source liquidity at that time. And we were a liquidity provider. But in terms of lessons learned, I would say having people that you're working with that are of the highest caliber. And I had that at Goldman to provide advisory and coaching along the way, staying unemotional and helping provide the best analysis to make the keenest decisions in the face of turmoil, which I do think that oftentimes those are the best opportunities arise as long as you have the liquidity needed to carry out whatever strategy you're trying to partake in. So I guess that would be the next lesson is just maintaining enough liquidity so you can have the staying power. That, and along with something that you said earlier, just around servicing clients, you're there to make prices, you're a liquidity provider. At some point, just with regard to how volatile markets can get, how illiquid they can become, there's, I can imagine, some challenge with the sometimes conflicting roles of being a liquidity provider, standing up for clients, wanting them to come back for a lot of repeat business, but also having proprietary positions that need to get risk managed as well. I'm curious if you can share some of just your thoughts on that. Maybe this can 
get us into your running of the swaps business at Barclays as well through the financial crisis. Just tell us about that balance. I'd be curious to learn a little bit more about, and I could share my own views because I have many, just being a liquidity provider, but also being mindful of the proprietary capital that you're overseeing as well. Yeah, I think there's been a real evolution. I think back then, there was a real culture of proprietary trading on market making desks, and that has evolved further away. I mean, frankly, a lot of the most liquid securities right now are the markets are being made by machines anyway. So I imagine they're calibrated to offer the right amount of liquidity without losing money. And to that extent, we've seen these air pockets where the liquidity disappears as the machines step back when correlation of assets goes higher during times of turmoil. So it's certainly been an evolution. But at that time, I think you make a good point. There was a balanced approach to both servicing clients, which actually has to come first. I always had a strategy and I was research-based. So I would always have a research framework. I knew before somebody asked me for a two-way on whatever it was, the long bond, a 10-year interest rate, swap, whatever. I knew which way I'd prefer to go before the call came in. And because I had a framework for, oh, I think that's rich on the curve, or I think that's cheap on the curve. And in terms of my strengths during those years, certainly I was a better relative value trader than I was a directional trader. That was a strength that I fed to. But the flip side of that equation is folks want liquidity that maybe they want liquidity a minute before payrolls. That was definitely stressful, taking down large amounts of risk with very little time ahead of very key data prints. Yeah, there was always, I think, an attempt for attribution across the client base. And in the equity and equity derivatives world, the commissions are paid explicitly. It's not a spread business. It's actually a commission business. So you know what's coming in. Then the next step is to try to measure what's going out in terms of loss ratios. And that was always a touchy subject sometimes and a tricky subject because it was difficult sometimes to truly measure where you could hedge something or what you would have done had you not gotten that call. So just trying to measure the value of a client both over time and then cross-sectionally the group of clients that you choose to do business with. So it's an interesting question of where you dedicate your resources as well. All those themes, they're interesting themes. And at the end of the day, the investment bank's They're serving a variety of clients and many of the relationships are much longer term relationships where they're trading less frequently and it's maybe more of a strategic relationship. I would put like the pensions and insurers. I traded the back end myself, so I knew a lot about the pension de-risking theme and that sort of thing. And then on the other side of the equation, you have the hedge funds, which can be more frequent traders, don't have to be. Sometimes you get macro traders that decide, oh, I'm going to trade inflation today and crude tomorrow. So there's something for everyone, I would say. And a robust business is able to meet the needs of all those clients. Well, take us through your time at Goldman and then transitioning to Barclays and tell us more about that period in your career, perhaps bring to life some of the uniqueness of that time period. I know that Your time at Barclays overlapped with the Lehman acquisition. Tell us a little bit about that transition from Goldman to Barclays. I moved back to the States with Goldman after one of my parents passed away and to help my other parents out, frankly, that was a big driver. But I moved back in haste and I ended up, I was trading the long bond and Barclays asked me if I was interested in running their swaps desk. And at that time, they were really trying to raise their game in the dollar rates business and credit and mortgages really across the board. I thought that would be interesting. And it was a great opportunity for me. Now, I will say the landscape there was was really very different. It was a British bank. They were just not nearly as far along in terms of the development of in-house systems and risk management systems, just the whole gamut. So it was a bit more of an entrepreneurial and Wild West sort of environment. But having said that, I wasn't alone in joining from a top tier firm. There were many others that had sort of come along 
to join this effort. So there were a lot of great people, but in terms of franchise value, we definitely didn't have the depth of the franchise value that Goldman did. It's certainly in the dollar rates business. There was plenty of work to do. And I'm a big believer in process and we stuck to our process. You mentioned the Lehman acquisition. That was actually a highlight of my career. I was asked to manage the dollar rate exposure of the Lehman acquisition, which I sort of live by a phrase. My kids have to hear this a lot. Luck favors the prepared. And that was absolutely an exercise in preparation in the days and weeks. I guess it was really just days because whatever, like an M&A deal that you could dream up, just take that and cram it into a few days. But we did a lot of preparation before the actual transaction took place. There wasn't a lot of sleep during that three-week window, let's say that. But it was certainly eye-opening and interesting times for me. I'd never really had a bird's eye view of an investment banking transaction before. I always wondered why those bankers were willing to work such long hours. I got a bird's eye front row seat to that. And that was an experience I really wouldn't trade. But in terms of hedging the the acquisition. It entailed going through all the assets on the Lehman book. And ultimately it was structured. The deal, it was pretty nifty. They structured the deal as a repo transaction, a repurchase agreement. So it was sort of like, hey, we'll loan you these securities and then we'll trim it up. And there you go. Voila, you bought them actually. So we were hedging around the clock. It was a bit of a game of whack-a-mole, if you will, like first order risks, second order risks, and right down the gamut. And the team in place, we also had a credit trader hedging credit, and they were really capable people on that team. It was exciting. Well, it goes back 15 years, but if you can, tell us more. This is super interesting. I assume it's late 08, early 09, as a lot of these hedges are being implemented. Markets weren't exactly liquid. They were pretty volatile. If you can, tell us more about what sorts of trades that needed to be done and who were the ultimate, not by name, but the counterparties that you found to effectively be the other side of the hedging demand you had? I can't share probably too much. I'm sure some of those guys would come out and crack me on the knuckles if I shared too much, but some lessons learned. You don't move a massive amount of risk in three minutes flat. And risk reduction was priority number one for certain far above making money on the hedges or anything. But then Over time, it became a management of the package of positions that we had. That was also an evolution and it wasn't done in a day putting the hedges on. But like I said, it was a crazy time and I did lose nine pounds in three weeks. I wish I could do that again. (laughs) But without getting into too much detail, it's what you would imagine for a very large transaction to be hedged over some window of time and then managed on the way out. So you were at Barclays for a period of time thereafter and then transitioned to a buy-side role at Tudor. Tell us about some of your time there and what your focus was there. Maybe you're sensing this, but I've always let my personal life guide some of my professional decisions. I was pregnant with my fourth child in five years and somebody approached me and said, hey, we're looking for somebody like you. Do you know anyone? And Tudor happened to be four miles away from where I lived. So of course, I'm thinking I know just the person. So that was sort of the shortcut route of how I was extremely intrigued. Now, Tudor had been a client of ours when I was at Barclays. So I knew a a few folks there. And I joined a team called the Flow of Funds Research and Portfolio Management Team. It's a hybrid team. And it was fascinating to me. They really... That group does a lot of research on where the money's going, the flows, and how folks are positioned. So how are the levered accounts positioned? How are real money folks positioned? What types of flows do the pensions of the world have to undertake over the coming years? So it's really a study in where the money's going, the central banks, the Japanese banks, domestic banks, we really covered the gamut. And it was very process-oriented and falling out of that process, 
there was a portfolio management role where we would put trades on based on the research that we did. That group still functions today and covers foreign exchange, commodities, equities, and fixed income around the globe. Really interesting stuff. And as far as I know, Tudor is a leader in that space. I don't know if other macros have filled out similar roles. I've always found the study of flows of crowding to be so critical. It's elusive in some ways. In the equity markets, there's a lot of work done towards attribution as to why the market moved. And someone's typically pointing a finger at the gamma of a position. It's difficult to really get close to it. And yet you step back and there's certainly instances where flows can truly overwhelm the market. You go back to 1987 for sure. And everybody's doing the same thing at the same time. Boy, you're going to see some vicious price reaction. So that's super interesting to be really trying to get in the weeds on the players and how they'll respond to different movements in price. That's right. The response mechanisms are different too. To your point, short squeezes are sort of the obvious one that you can point to because levered players don't have the time or If they're wrong, they really need to cut more quickly or oftentimes anyway. Whereas a pension fund, for instance, might welcome higher interest rates and might have a much longer path with which they're willing to buy. So there is some degree of art form in it, but I do think it helps any process to be informed of who the major players and what their motivations are in the various markets. I don't want to skip forward too much, but it's just as you describe pension funds and reactions to higher interest rates, I can't help but ask about the 2022 blow up in long dated gilts and just the degree to which swap exposure and duration risk in a levered way seem to be complicit. I'd love to get some of your take on that. To your point, the confluence of factors really came together there. And I think other players in the market with concentrated levered positions and gilts really gave it a real squeeze. The fascinating part to me is, and I'd have to double check, but rates are probably right back where they were. They took the elevator straight down. And when I mean straight down, higher in yield, and then spent a good time rallying back. But Now we seem to be on our way back up in yields. So I'm just looking. I think that those 30-year gilts, they went from 230 to 5% in what felt like no time at all over the course of a month or a month and a half. And then after recovering some, they're back to 457 right now. But that's the point, is that when you get a bunch of players that are same way around that have to move quickly all together, we get outsized moves. And that's what we saw there for sure. It's always interesting and humbling to see something, especially in the aftermath, whether it's the gilts blow up, we had the oil prices, at least on a futures basis, going momentarily negative in April of 2020. That was a bit of a keyhole effect from ETFs. You had a VIX blow up in 2018. So I always ask myself, you know, what's out there that we just don't necessarily know about. And it just seems to me that all of us have a home market. For me, it's equity derivatives. Some people spend their time in rates or in FX. It's really hard to see everything. It's pretty humbling to see these things materialize. And sometimes it's too late. And then you realize that someone, you know, in the case of gilts, there were people writing about it for a decent amount of time beforehand saying that this was some version of of a risk where, as you say, the boat could get just too lopsided to one side. I don't know if you've been around as long as I have, but I've seen some crazy things. Most recently, last year with the nickel situation and them breaking the trades. Oh, right. That was stunning to me that they broke the trades because I'll tell you, one time when I was in London, there used to be two and only two, frankly, electronic market-making systems, uh, Broker Tech and eSpeed. And they were inverted prices. You could buy at one price and hit the bid at a much higher price simultaneously. And there was a systematic issue with one of those machines. And I won't name names, but it took them some time to correct that. But 
I think they re- reached some kind of negotiation, but they wouldn't have taken for somebody that was able to make profits on that. They wouldn't have taken them negative. I was really surprised that they broke those nickel trades. We have seen some crazy things. And to your point, you never know what's lying under the covers brewing until it actually happens and everybody needs to move at the same time. I also point to these flash crashes that we've seen, because if I were the master architect or engineer behind the electronic trading systems, when things are going south and they're all of a sudden not making money, the first thing you do is just, hey, shut it off. Something's wrong here. (laughs) But you don't necessarily see that, well, wait a second, there's a real market making participant that just dropped. Whereas way back in the day, everything was just slower. If I were getting hit on a yard of tens and I didn't know what the liquidity was, but maybe I'd be testing the liquidity. And sometimes a billion 10 year swaps wouldn't move the market and other times it would move the market, but you didn't really know until you were in there transacting. And I think there's some degree of that, but just at a much faster pace right now as liquidity providers enter and exit, and it's roughly invisible to the market. Although one of the dealers, they have a liquidity report where they're trying to measure these type things in the interest rate markets. And I have to believe that the Fed continues to monitor these things because when I was at Tudor and in in previous roles as well, I, I know there are several groups at the Fed that try to monitor stability and liquidity across markets. And I think those are prudent things to do. Well, these market accidents are probably a feature, not a bug at this point in markets. We almost have to accept them for what they are. They just happen much more frequently than the models say they should. And it's just something you've got to be careful about. And as you start to get into your role at Gen Trust and the firm's mission, you're trying to help your clients keep their capital to help it grow, but certainly to keep it. So you're in the risk management business on behalf of your clients. Tell us about the firm, Gen Trust, and then we'll get into some of the products and what you guys are thinking in terms of the delivery to clients. Let me start by saying a few of the things that motivated me to join Gen Trust. I really wanted to, when I was thinking about what I was going to do when I grow up, I was thinking about, (laughs) I really want to work with people that I've worked with before. So I've been around long enough and that was important to me. I also wanted to be able to learn something and contribute something. And frankly, I knew that my own personal finances were not really optimized. So the combination of those things really piqued my interest in GenTrust as our CIO, Jim Visa, was running the swaptions desk next to me at Barclays. And I also had worked with several of the other folks there, both at Goldman and Barclays. So those were big drivers for me. But GenTrust is an RIA or a multifamily office is sort of an easier thing to understand. We're independent fiduciaries, which basically means we're obligated to do what's in the best interest of our clients. So we have a higher bar than the suitability standard, like, is this suitable for a client? But instead, is this the best possible way forward for the client? That's one way in which we differ from some of the other folks in the wealth advisory landscape, which, by the way, is very complicated. What runs the gamut from the wirehouse dealer-based models where it's unlikely that if you're working with XYZ private bank that they're going to say, well, this other bank actually has a better mortgage rate, for instance. (laughs) So there's those folks. There's the robo-advisories, which really serve a purpose as well, I think. They check a lot of boxes in terms of using low-fee ETFs and rebalancing and doing some of the systematic stuff that you might be interested in. And they don't necessarily have conflicts of interest or anything like that. And then on the other side, you have single family offices where you can be sure, or you'd like to be sure that the folks working for your, if you were a billionaire for your single family office are acting in your best interest. So we're more along the lines of that single family office, but we're working for many families at a much lower price point. But with the spirit of delivering fiduciary asset management 
and all the other things that come along with the wealth management picture. Well, you mentioned some of the very large platforms perhaps having a pretty obvious conflict of interest in terms of not necessarily making their competitors' products available, even at a better price. So that's one. You also mentioned robo-advisors. So that seems to be, from a trend standpoint and a technology standpoint, getting at fees, for sure. At least that's part of the solution. If you were to step back and just think about deficiencies or incomplete aspects of the business, the landscape of wealth advisory, what are some of the other areas of improvement that you and GenTrust are trying to deliver? On the independent side, in the RAA space, it's really fragmented. There's loads of small RAAs with 100 million under assets. We're around 3 billion to put it in perspective. Somebody was mentioning an RAA to me, a large RAA, and they said they have 60 billion. You don't know who they are? And I said, no, I don't. I kind of felt like, what? There's a player out there with 60 billion that I don't know about? Okay, I looked them up. Their average account size is 175 grand. So I was like, okay, they're very different than our business model. And some of these RIAs, they are all independent. Some of them lead with financial planning. That's a big thing for a lot of people. Like, hey, am I going to have enough money to retire? Or am I doing the right thing in saving for college for my kids? Or some of these day-to-day questions. Hey, I'm charitably inclined. What's the most tax-efficient way to do that? Should I be opening a donor-advised fund? And these are important things for our clients too. Don't get me wrong. But in many cases, and for us, our clients are at a much higher wealth level. Typically, if somebody's got 10 or 20 or 50 million with us, it's likely that their net worth is at least twice that. So they're often have different problems or challenges, which might be concentration risk or some business risk or liquidity. Maybe 90% of their portfolio is illiquid or they've got a lot of assets tied up in a business. So what we try to bring to the table is a degree of sophistication that you wouldn't find at a lot of other shops. For instance, we've got more than 150 years of institutional experience on our investment team. By that, I mean folks that have run trading desks at dealers. They're specialists in given products. They've worked at hedge funds. They really understand risk management and problem solving. That's a really big differentiator for us. Another one, we're super focused on fees and tax awareness. We focus on asset allocation, which really drives returns and the risk profile, diversification. These are big themes, but we also are looking at asset location. Like if we're looking at a specific asset, what's the best place to put that security or investment? Is it inefficient from a tax perspective? And is it better off in a retirement account? That sort of thing. And then just a couple other things that we really bring from the institutional side is transparency and accountability. All of our clients have benchmarks, which is something that on the institutional side, everybody has a benchmark and they talk about their returns versus their benchmark. It's something that we do. And we're super transparent with that and super accountable. So our goal is to beat the benchmark after fees certainly over a long time period. And our investors, our clients, their time horizon tends to be multi-generational. So that's one of the things that we bring from the institutional side. Another is that we stress test portfolios to hypothetical and historical risk scenarios. So we can see how a given portfolio that we've structured or that's come over to us. Because remember, a lot of our accounts have concentration risk, whether they're senior execs at a public firm where they have a lot of unvested shares, whatever it is, we can stress test those portfolios and look at potential hedges when necessary. This uh, concept of client by client benchmarking is pretty interesting. Can you speak a little bit more about it? Stylistically, tell us about how a benchmark would be constructed. Is it with the client's input or how do you come about it? This is not a gen trust thing. This is an RIA and a wealth management thing that like the suitability is a portfolio able to meet the client's needs from a risk and return 
standpoint, but also provide the given liquidity that's required. So we have an intake process. Everybody would have an intake process and with a targeted asset allocation mix. Where the benchmark comes in is more when it comes down to reporting returns. Let's say we did have a 60-40 portfolio, which we're not the biggest fans of vanilla 60-40s because we think that clients should have some exposure to real assets. So most of our portfolios, for instance, have around a 5% allocation to real assets. And those are the type of assets that are meant to perform well in high inflationary environments like we've seen over the last couple of years. Just to be basic, let's pretend we had a 60-40. The benchmark would be 60% MSCI, which is the global go-to equity benchmark. And the 40 would be the Barclays Bloomberg aggregate, formerly known as the Lehman Ag. Those are two benchmarks that the world uses on the institutional side, and they're the go-to indices. On the muni side, we use the BAML 1 to 10 year. On the real asset side, for lack of a better benchmark, we use the GSCI, which doesn't mirror our portfolio in the real assets, but we don't have a better solution just so we have some variability in performance in that segment. But the main spirit is that we should be benchmarking ourselves, how are we doing versus some really common benchmarks. And in terms of what the industry can do better, this is a gold standard on the institutional side. It really should be a gold standard on the retail side. A lot of things have improved for retail investors, but I don't see this on many RAA reports. I don't see it on wirehouse reports. I'll see maybe like at the bottom, the S&P 500 is year to date up here, but it doesn't really put it into context for the client in an easy way. And I think the industry can do better. Can you talk a little bit more about the stress testing process? I saw that you've got these historical risk episodes, those that have materialized. And then as you, I think, alluded to this sense of forward-looking shocks that are a set of asset price movements in wayward directions that would be unwelcome as well. (laughs) Tell us just about that process. And because stress markets become illiquid markets, we can move on to some of your thoughts on just balancing liquidity and illiquidity risk. Bigger picture, you know, when you think of the big institutional players, again, this is coming out of their playbooks. You read about bank stress tests on the hedge fund side, you know, they're stress testing portfolios. So we do the same thing. On the historical loss scenarios, some of the scenarios that we've modeled are the tech bubble, SEP 11, the Lehman going under, the Greek bond spreads going crazy, the global financial crisis, flash crash, Black Monday. So what we do is we take these really critical historical situations And we shock our portfolios against what the market movements were in those scenarios. And then on the future loss scenarios, it is absolutely a bit of a pie in the sky, but our investment team gets together and we talk about what's out there around the corner that might come to fruition. And an example of this, we actually had an inflation scare loss scenario five years ago, four years ago, and it came to fruition because we dream up, what do we think are going to happen to treasuries in that situation? What happens to inflation and inflation bonds in that situation? What happens to US equities, to commodities, that sort of thing? We didn't get everything just right, but we did get the direction and the magnitude about right. And that gives us a lot of comfort in terms of the merits of the exercise. A couple of the other things we talk about, just to name a couple, like a cyber attack, possibly, or a funding crisis, or some of the geopolitical risks that we're seeing right now, if they were to get exacerbated from here. So those are the types of future loss scenarios that we consider. And we're looking at potential market moves and then stress testing the client's portfolios against that adverse dream situation. There's so many aspects of potential market risk, most of which don't materialize. We're supposed to be aware of them. COVID, China, you mentioned inflation, things like the debt ceiling, war in Ukraine, all kinds of things that market participants are forced to at least acknowledge. And I'm curious if you can just 
reflect on the balance of being risk aware, very risk minded, ready to act. But I can imagine a big part of the goal here from a long term compounding perspective is to keep clients invested. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of scope to get into and out of the market based on every headline. I just was hoping you could just share some broad thoughts on the balance between being very aware of the risks, stress testing the risks, but also trying to play for the long haul as well. You definitely don't want to just get in and out. That's very tax inefficient to your point. And I think it's important to like, we're never going to know what the biggest days, up days, down days are. I'll leave that to other folks, but there's loads of studies and pretty pictures and showing, oh, if you miss the five best days, this would be your outcome. Our goal is really to have our accounts in portfolios that are appropriate for them. And we will put overall hedge overlays where we think that there's exacerbated risks, certainly to help ease some of that malaise in some cases. I think it does come down to the appropriateness of the risk levels of a given portfolio, though. To your point also, equities, they have better tax treatment than ordinary income on bonds. I mean, treasuries are state and local tax exempt. That's great. These are the types of things, by the way, that I really wasn't optimizing for in my former life. <laughs> you know, but I'm certainly keenly aware now. So I think your point about keeping investors keeping them in the market. Somebody once said to me, actually, don't you feel bad if the markets go down? And I said, no, I don't feel bad. I don't know if the markets are going up or down. I can't judge my how I'm feeling based on that. I would feel bad if I didn't have a plan. And for us, the plan, like we have a plan and there are things that we can do to help clients have better long-term outcomes that work better in down markets. For instance, you know, some of the tax loss harvesting, some of the Roth conversions, and then there are other things that work better in up markets. If you knew that you wanted to make a donation to a charitable donation, you might be inclined to donate appreciated shares that works better in an up market. So I think it comes down to having the plan and making sure that we're covering all the bases and our clients are covered both on the investment side, but also we can make sure that they have what they need on the estate planning and accounting side too. But to have that plan and to make sure that we're sticking to a plan. Some of the efforts at risk managing a portfolio are going to come from diversification. Tell us about how you guys think about diversification and then the balancing of super on the run, liquid, almost cash-like assets versus illiquid assets that might have a more favorable expected return, but you are bearing some illiquidity risk. If there ever was a free lunch, it's diversification. Definitely. <laughs> and compounding. Here, I'll give you two free lunches. I mean, we never know in advance what the winners are going to be. So you're going to want to own everything. That's kind of the general thesis. And we're big believers in diversification. As I mentioned, so many of the access to individual investment vehicles. Now it's just so much better for individuals than it was 20, 30 years ago. Just think about the high fee mutual funds that didn't beat the index versus an index tracking S&P 500 ETF charging three basis points in fees. So the products have gotten a lot better. We are very cost aware. Sometimes it's hard to get access to a given industry or segment of the market through very, very low cost options. So in the real asset space, for instance, lumber or rail car leasing, these sorts of things, you're not going to find an ETF that's going to necessarily offer you the best availability or access to some of those investments. So when we look at when does it make sense to move into the alternative space, we really are asking ourselves, you're giving up liquidity, you better be getting compensated in a higher expectation of return for that. And is it diversifying? And also within a given space that you're looking at, have you considered all the alternatives in that space? And is this a best-in-class provider? 
So that's kind of the framework that we look at for alternatives. We have a high threshold and I think they certainly have a place in portfolios, but they really do need to compensate you for the lack of liquidity. Seems like you guys have a pretty high bar in terms of that trade-off and bearing illiquidity risk and it needing to deliver diversification and have a favorable expected return profile. You mentioned the manager, and I just was curious around the balance between a favorable view on the manager versus, or maybe it's an and, the risk exposure itself. How much time do you spend trying to find these favorable asset classes, these diversifiers? And then if you found one, how much time is spent on differentiating and trying to find that best-in-class manager? A lot of the various asset classes that we have on our menu-based approach to alternatives are driven by our customer base. They're saying, hey, we're looking for exposure in biotech, or hey, I'd really like to get some exposure in tax-deferred, whatever it is. That's part of the process is we're constantly talking to our clients and trying to understand where they're seeking additional exposure. Add to that where we feel like the exposure is difficult to get through the public liquid markets. And then it comes down to the asset manager selection. So I think it is an and, Dean. I'm going to go with the and. It's everything. (laughs) Well, let's talk about just the way in which the current structure of interest rates makes its way into the process. And so if we go back to, I don't know, 2017, we still had exceptionally low short rates, very low longer term rates. We obviously had that mini tightening cycle in 2018. It turned around in 2019 and obviously massively turned around in 2020. So we've had these extremely low rate periods. And now we've got a five plus percent short rate, a four-ish percent long rate, How different is the process for allocating for your clients in this interest rate environment versus several years ago? It's much easier. It's much, much better. There was this whole, there is no alternative Tina argument where we can't own bonds because they're so low yielding. And not that you would want to own too many of those bonds, but we did have some alternative vehicles that were diversifying negatively correlated that kind of check some boxes. Because why do you want bonds, really? You want to have bonds in your portfolio to generate some income, but also to enable a more frictionless rebalancing activity. So again, this is something that on the institutional side is done all the time. It should be done on the retail side all the time when it makes sense. By that, I mean, imagine you have a 50-50 benchmark stocks bonds. And then imagine you have a 25% drawdown in in equities. You want to be in the position where you're selling bonds to buy more equities. And oh, by the way, if the bonds happen to be up, that's even better. So that's what, for many years, we had these negatively correlated stocks and bonds. And last year, they both went down, as everybody knows. But we do think that bonds hold a role in portfolios for those reasons. The nice thing about adding fixed income to portfolios now is we have positive real yields, nearing 2% in 10 years and above 2% in fives in the long end. And we haven't seen these yields, by the way, since 2006. So I do think there's some chronic underinvestment in bonds. And it's a much easier pill to swallow when you're putting together a diverse portfolio Of anything, I think it's easier to say that some segments of the stock market are getting a little cheeky in terms of they have high expectations. But on the bond side, even as bonds back up from here, or if they back up from here, I think that longer term investors will be able to earn their way out over time. So if you don't have bonds in a private wealth portfolio, there's certainly room to add and cash rates are great. Five and a half percent for six month T-bills, state and local tax exempt. Not bad. Good too. Not a bad place to start. (laughs) Little bit of this and a little bit of that. Yeah, exactly. Well, you mentioned some of these alternative exposures, rails, you mentioned, I think you mentioned aircraft leasing as well. Are there any other 
areas of research that you and the team are currently engaged in trying to learn more about that could become future allocations for the clients of GenTrust? Just to step back, I don't think we're in the aircraft leasing area, not yet anyway, Okay. but I think private credit is something that we're looking hard at. We think that could be good opportunities in terms of the yields generated now versus previous years. That's the sort of thing that it, you certainly have a lot of illiquidity there, so you want to be compensated. But there are a lot of segments of the economy that are less interest rate or less recession exposure, if you will, in the private credit world. So that's something that we're looking closely at, along with some of the other segments. I mentioned biotech, some of the segments of the real estate market that aren't necessarily tied to multifamily or more recession-proof segments of the real estate market. But those are a couple of themes that we're looking at. Well, I was hoping we could close out the conversation, Mimi, with some of your reflections on your career. I think you had mentioned, I'm not sure if it was on this call, but certainly we discussed that you've got four children, all girls. You had four children in five years while having a substantial and I'm sure stressful role on Wall Street. So that's incredibly unique and challenging. It's not something that males take on. Tell us about just being a female in the industry. Some of the conversations I have with other female guests are trying to learn more about efforts made to expand opportunities for females in our industry, some of which have borne fruit, but I'm sure there's a long way to go. I'd love for you to reflect on that just in terms of being a mother and having an extremely senior role at the same time. Tell us just a little bit more about some of those challenges. It's a tough question. I'm happy to talk about my experiences. It's really complicated. I mean, at the end of the day, we're people and we're not just machines. And when you bring little people into the equation, somebody has to care for them. And I think to the extent that companies can become more supportive of life's transitions, I'm part of the sandwich generation and looking after aging parents is also can be challenging. So I think to the extent that companies can just be aware and more supportive, not just for women, but also for men. And I am seeing some real movements in the policy changes there. I never took a day over 12 weeks maternity leave because I knew that the Family Medical Leave Act had me covered with 12 weeks, but not a day longer. I think Goldman was a leader in terms of putting forth, when I left Goldman, they had a four-month maternity policy, and I didn't have that ever again. I didn't have any kids at Goldman. <laughs> but when I joined Tudor, you had to earn your maternity. So I didn't have paid maternity leave at Tudor. Now, I don't think the partners, the senior guys at Tudor had any idea that that was their policy. And when I mentioned that years later to the HR team that was asking me, what do you think of our policies? They changed their policies. So they did a big study. They, I don't know what they are now, but they instituted four months maternity leave. You didn't have to earn it. And one month paternity leave. So I think some of this is that when you know better, you do better. And I think that we need to be in the position to kind of point out where we think we could do better. I'll be honest, I didn't feel like I could just point that out on my way in as I joined pregnant. <laughs> so, but having had my kids and I'm done, just to be clear, <laughs> I think that to the extent we can have policies that better support families and equal pay. I think Europe has been a leader in some of the pay comparisons and just support people, not just women, but men also through some of the transitions in life. Because I'll tell you, those are difficult years in terms of being very, very high stress. And the other thing I'll mention, just because I think a lot of guys have no idea what to say, but some of the stuff that came out of people's mouths when I would tell them I was pregnant. And when a woman is saying that they're pregnant to a boss or whatever it is, they've thought about this conversation 15 times in their mind before they choked out the words. So my advice to people is to say, congratulations, wholeheartedly and without delay. <laughs> and just to understand that that's a tough conversation for any 
working woman that values their career to have. And then I would just say, like, for myself, I've always viewed it as the long game. And my kids are getting older now. And I hope that companies will view it as the long game, too, because I do feel strongly that having a diverse workforce results in better outcomes for all. So I guess that's my thoughts on that. In terms of getting more women into the business, at least at Goldman, when I was in those early training programs, gosh, there were a lot of women coming in and they kind of trickle out for various reasons, some of which they don't get promoted or they go somewhere else. I think there are better ways that we can support women in their careers I'd like to see more of that, but just understanding that these are complicated situations when there's people on the line too, and that that need little people that need care. Well, I really appreciate you sharing that personal experience. I have to say it's remarkable, your career and being able to rise to these very senior levels with so much responsibility and be a mom of four in the process. So kudos to you. That's to me, a real role model. Mimi, I want to thank you very much for uh, taking the time to be a guest on the Alpha Exchange. It's been really great to learn more about your career, and I think our listeners will enjoy this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Dean. You've been listening to the Alpha Exchange. If you've enjoyed the show, please do tell a friend. And before we leave, I wanted to invite you to drop us some feedback. As we aim to utilize these conversations to contribute to the investment community's understanding of risk, Your input is valuable and provides direction on where we should focus. Please email us at feedback at alphaexchangepodcast.com. Thanks again and catch you next time.